talking to you about high resolution imaging of the cranial nerves and uh, the approach we've taken at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. I do have a few disclosures. By the end of the lecture, I'd like you to be able to describe the uh, segments of the cranial nerves, the uh, different portions of the cranial nerves on MRI imaging. I'll be talking to you about our uh, segmental nomenclature, our naming system for the cranial nerves, the different parts of the cranial nerves, which I think helps conceptually organize our approach to uh, imaging of the different portions of the cranial nerves and optimizes uh, the extent to which we can see most of the nerves, the, the entirety of the nerves. We'll describe uh, some of the common tumors in passing and uh, identify some of the, the primary tumors. So first an introduction. Uh, we'll talk about the segmental nomenclature general MRI uh, technique, yeah, high resolution MRI technique, and then we'll talk about the cranial nerves segment by segment and talk about our imaging approach to each segment and uh, look at some anatomic and some pathologic images and then we'll end. So first, uh, a few words about the anatomy of the cranial nerves. Uh, we like to divide the cranial nerves up into generic segments uh, so that we can uh, describe the specific portion of the cranial nerves that we're talking about to our colleagues, both in radiology, neuroradiology, and in neurology and neurosurgery. If you look in the literature, there are very many uh, different terms for the cranial nerves, the different cranial nerves. Uh, but this is an attempt to bring all of that information together in a way which applies to them all. So we start out here on the left-hand side of the screen with our generic cranial nerve with uh, nuclei in the brainstem with the A or nuclear segment. We have the B or parenchymal fascicular segment where the nerve fibers of the cranial nerve extend toward the surface of the brainstem but have not yet left the brainstem. Then we have the C or cisternal segment where the cranial nerves are surrounded by fluid, the fluid, the cerebral spinal fluid in the subarachnoid space. The nerves then come into close proximity to, but do not yet pass through the inner layer of dura. We know that there are two layers of dura, an inner and an outer layer of dura. And uh, in the D or dural cave segment, the cranial nerves are still surrounded by the fluid of the cerebral spinal fluid within the subarachnoid space. Uh, but they've come into close proximity to that inner layer of the dura. In the E or interdural segment, the cranial nerves are between those two layers of dura. And uh, in the F or foraminal segment, the cranial nerves have to pass through the uh, holes in the skull base, the foramina, to get out of the skull, with the exception, of course, of the eighth cranial nerve, which is the only cranial nerve that doesn't exit the skull, the vestibular cochlear nerve. The last segment is the G segment, or extra foraminal segment. And this is where the cranial nerves uh, extend to the uh, various organs that they innervate. I should mention that I'm talking about the cranial nerves as if they are all, uh, for the sake of simplicity, motor nerves extending from the brainstem out into the, the body, out into the face, uh, that they are all efferent nerves. Of course, we know there are sensory components of the nerves as well but it's uh, easier to speak of them uh, generically in that fashion. We can refer to the cranial nerves in shorthand, specifically to the portion that we're talking about, uh, by using this extension, which I'll use uh, the, uh, during this lecture, cranial nerve, the number, and then the extension, the portion of the cranial nerve that we're talking about, where uh, the extension is the segment by letter as I've described them. So this, uh, this system of nomenclature is one which we believe provides us a concise and specific means of communication with clinicians. And it has some implications for differential diagnosis. Uh, but importantly, most importantly for us today, it should alter our imaging approach uh, to the different portions of the cranial nerve. Depending upon which cranial portion of the cranial nerve, which segment of the cranial nerve we're talking about, we may need to alter our imaging approach. So this is the, the protocol, uh, the next two slides, three slides perhaps on the, the protocol which we're using at Johns Hopkins. We use essentially exclusively 3D high resolution imaging with multiple different sequences which I'll show you in a moment. But we're using 3D isotropic imaging uh, which as you know we acquire during the entirety of the uh, acquisition of the sequence uh, 
And then post hoc, we're able to take the 3D slab and reconstruct the imaging uh, here, for instance, in the coronal plane and in the sagittal plane from a single acquisition. So we're no longer doing uh, 2D imaging. We've shifted to 3D imaging for this application. The pre-contrast portion of our protocol calls for uh, T1 weighted imaging. We're using on the, the Siemens magnets called VIBE, a 3D a T1 weighted technique. And uh, we use um, this for the T1 weighting. We have uh, CIS imaging. I'll talk about that in some more detail in a few moments. And uh, then we, uh, this is a, a mix, um, it appears to be a heavily T2 weighted sequence, but in fact it's a, a sequence with uh, mixed weighting in a way which uh, is really quite useful for imaging of the skull base and of the cranial nerves. And more on that in just a few moments. And here's stir space imaging. We use a 3D uh, stir space sequence uh, to give us a, a T2, a typical T2 weighting. So notice here on the VIBE pre-contrast imaging that the asterisk is on a mass, a mass which is T1 hypo-intense in the skull base. This mass is T2 hyper-intense on the stir space imaging. The stir space imaging giving us our typical uh, weighting uh, for evaluation of masses. And notice how the mass is not quite as bright on the cis imaging. We don't want to look at the cis imaging uh, quite as much for the uh, intrinsic signal properties of the mass. Uh, the cis imaging we re rely upon because of its high signal to noise uh, ratio efficiency and for the uh, high spatial resolution which it affords in a reasonable amount of time. So the pre-contrast we're using the um, vibe sequence post-contrast we do vibe imaging again but we do that with fat saturation. The pre-contrast imaging you want the fat to be visible. Fat uh, allows for intrinsic contrast at the skull base and for the evaluation of pathologic replacement of uh, fatty marrow and such. Post-contrast, we want to do fat saturated imaging to increase the conspicuity of enhancement. Then we do uh, cis imaging post-contrast and uh, cis imaging again is a um, mixed weighting technique and it allows us to see enhancement in addition to the T2 properties. Okay, so uh, we get our T2 appearance from the stir space imaging. And uh, here's our enhancement on the vibe post contrast. And this is a chordoma, of course, T1 hypo-intense, T2 hyper-intense and enhancing. But it's really the, the center of the protocol, the meat of the protocol, the key sequence here is the cis imaging, the comparison pre and post uh, contrast. So cis imaging stands for constructive interference in the steady state. It has other names on other manufacturers, magnets, Fiesta C on GE, balanced fast field echo on Philips. It's highly SNR efficient. It appears to be T2 weighted, but in fact it has mixed T2 and T1 weighting. And uh, we also, I should mention, do perform uh, the standard, some components of our standard head protocol, but the coverage for our skull base protocol, the cis, uh, sorry, the uh, cranial nerve protocol, which is the skull base protocol, covers just the region of the skull base in high resolution 3D imaging. We're performing the stir space imaging at one millimeter isotropic, the vibe imaging at eight tenths of a millimeter isotropic, the cis imaging at six tenths of a millimeter isotropic, again to allow for the greatest uh, degree of, of um, anatomic detail. And uh, the same parameters are used um, in terms of voxel size post contrast. So a few words about the A and B segments. The A and B segments, we don't see them uh, all that uh, well, we take a, uh, the standard approach to imaging the nuclear and parenchymal fascicular segments. They're surrounded by the brain stem. They're not directly visualized typically, except sometimes we can see the, uh, the region on diffusion tensor imaging. And, but we can infer their location uh, based on known anatomic landmarks. And uh, so we perform, we look at these with the standard bit of the, um, the head MRI. Here's a patient as an example with an infarct on diffusion weighted imaging, the B1000 image of the uh, diffusion weighted image. Uh, here's a focal infarct on the left side of the midbrain causing a right superior oblique palsy. This is of course an infarct, uh, it happens to be an infarct in high value real estate in the region of the nucleus, the A segment for the, the trochlear nerve. Uh, one of the things I do at Hopkins is teach neuroanatomy through dissection to the medical students. And here's an image from the dorsal part of the brainstem, just to remind you of the location uh, where the uh, trochlear nerve exits the brainstem. 
because we can use that knowledge to infer more or less the location of the parenchymal fascicular and often the nuclear segments. Here's the pineal gland. Uh, these are the superior colliculi from the dorsal aspect. Notice my thumb is in the fourth ventricle. This is again a dorsal view. I've removed the cerebellum. Here are the inferior colliculi, and uh, those are the trochlear nerves that are arising just caudal to the inferior colliculi, lateral to the uh, frenulum of the superior medullary vellum. So this is the nuclear segment again of the trochlear nerve. Here's the parenchymal fascicular segment. And diagrammatically, remember, it decussates. It crosses the midline before exiting the brainstem, and that's why the patient had a right-sided superior oblique palsy despite having a stroke on the left side. The next segments are the C and D segments. These are the segments that are surrounded by the fluid, the cerebral spinal fluid and the subarachnoid space. Uh, and for this reason, they are well visualized on a thin section T2 weighted imaging, no matter which uh, technique is applied. So you can use 3D steady state free procession imaging, uh, cis imaging, Fiesta, balanced fast field echo, sequences as I've described them on the prior slides are types of steady state free procession imaging or a, a more typical spin echo T2 weighted sequence like T2 space uh, which had, does not have mixed weighting will also um, allow or, or at least not to the same extent will allow for visualization of the cisternal and dural cave segments. Now sometimes we do modify the protocol that we apply uh, the, this protocol is used uh, at our institution for imaging of each of the cranial nerves, but there are certain modifications that are occasionally necessary. The fourth cranial nerve is really one of the smallest of the cranial nerves in diameter. And uh, here in the uh, left-hand figure, the central figure, and the right-hand figure, you can see this is a patient I uh, imaged um, at, for trochlear nerve palsy. And uh, when I, I was performing the, the study, and um, at first I did a 0 0.6 millimeter isotropic view with cis imaging without contrast and I wasn't able to see the nerve well and in fact often when we think we see the nerve on uh, standard imaging we're in fact uh, sometimes seeing adjacent veins in this region so this was at six tenths of a millimeter isotropic and it was really only at four tenths of a millimeter isotropic uh, that you can begin to see with confidence the trochlear nerve extending through the cistern uh, we also sometimes uh, use a higher spatial resolution in pediatric patients where the structures are smaller. But apart from that, this is a, a standardized protocol and is applied for all of the cranial nerves at our institution. I'd like to remind you that the cranial nerves extend from the uh, central nervous system into the peripheral nervous system. And uh, the, the, uh, for that reason, centrally, they're myelinated by oligodendrocytes and peripherally by Schwann cells here in a uh, ventral view of the brainstem from the, the text by the German anatomist Johannes Long. We can see the uh, uh, dark portion, the black portion is the centrally myelinated portion. And, uh, and then there's a transition from the cranial nerves passed through from the central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system, which is called the transition zone, or sometimes given the eponym, the Obersteiner red leg zone. And uh, the fiber bundles in the central nervous system properly uh, are tracts. Those in the peripheral nervous system are uh, typically referred to as nerves. So cranial nerve one and two, the olfactory nerve, which we see here, and the optic nerve are really properly tracts. They're portions of the central nervous system and do not have peripheral myelination. Notice, too, that here are the eighth cranial nerve going towards, the, here's the internal auditory meatus. The uh, eighth cranial nerve throughout the cistern is centrally myelinated. It's unusual in that regard. And so one clinical implication of this is that if you see a mass along the eighth cranial nerve proximal to the brain stem, it cannot be a schwannoma. Schwannomas arise in the peripheral nervous system, the white portion here, the portion that is myelinated uh, by the Schwann cells, not the central nervous system. Here are uh, some anatomic images uh, to demonstrate, um, as an example, the third cranial nerve, the 3C segment, you can see the, the oculomotor nerve extending anteriorly through the cistern just medial to the uncus. And uh, here it is in the coronal view uh, below the, the posterior cerebral artery above it and the superior cerebral artery below it. Here's a pathologic case. Uh, to orient you, this is the, uh, a sagittal view with the uh, posterior part of the patient's head, the back of their head over here on the right hand side of the screen in the front of their head. The eye would be here on the left-hand side of the screen. This is the midbrain, the pons, the medulla. 
Here's the cisternal segment of the third nerve, and uh, in the distal cisternal segment, you can see that it fans out. It changes diameter from about 1.5 millimeters in diameter to about 2.5 millimeters in diameter. We would not see, I would say, that change in diameter on standard imaging. It's only when we do uh, thin section high resolution uh, and typically 3D imaging that we can detect a change like that. So this uh, patient has a, an abnormally thickened distal third nerve. And here is an example of, this is pre-contrast cyst imaging. Here's the post-contrast cyst imaging. Notice how that abnormal portion of the nerve, which is thickened to 2.5 millimeters in diameter, is also pathologically enhancing. This is what enhancement looks like on cyst imaging. It's an increase in intensity from the baseline uh, normal darkness of the nerve. The cranial nerves do not typically uh, enhance except for the ganglia. And here you can see the reason why. This is a, a very elongated aneurysm arising from the posterior communicating artery uh, origin and uh, coming down to compress the third cranial nerve from above. So this is a compressive uh, third nerve palsy. Here in the coronal view, we have a fused image with an MRA. You can see the normal third nerve on the right side in the dural cave segment. And here, on the left-hand side of the patient in the coronal view, the aneurysm obliterates the area where uh, the third nerve ought to be. So this is a patient who presented with a left-sided third nerve palsy, a compressive third nerve palsy, and uh, used here as an example of uh, how enhancement looks on cis imaging. This is, uh, we use this imaging uh, approach extensively for operative planning. Here's an example of why that's useful. When the neurosurgeons come to me, what they often want to know uh, preoperatively is where are the vital structures adjacent to the mass. And uh, here in a coronal post-contrast vibe image, you can see in the, the asterisk is on an enhancing cellar and supracellar mass, a meningioma. And uh, the, pain, the uh, neurosurgeons would want to know, for instance, where are the optic nerves adjacent to the mass. It's hard to figure that out uh, frequently on the T1-weighted imaging. But on post-contrast cis imaging, you can see the deformity of the optic nerve adjoining the mass on both sides. This is useful information, obviously, for the neurosurgeon in planning their approach. Now, the, the uh, dural cave segment of the cranial nerves, the most uh, famous one, the most well-known, is obviously that of the fifth cranial nerve. The, here's uh, Meckel's cave, uh, where the, um, the fifth nerve is coming into proximity to, but not yet passing through the dura. And uh, here, the all, but each of the cranial nerves has to go through that transition uh, and uh, have a dural cave, often a small dural cave, but they're present. Here in the coronal view, on a pre-contrast cis image, you can see the oculomotor nerve in a small dural cave surrounded by cerebral spinal fluid, the same thing in the sagittal view, a sagittal reconstruction of the same image. Moving on to the interdural uh, segment, the E segment in our classification system, the inner layer of dura is often known as, uh, alternatively, as the cerebral layer of dura, the outer layer, the periosteal layer of dura. Uh, sometimes the inner layer is also known as the meningeal layer. And um, in this space, the cranial nerves are surrounded often by venous blood. And uh, for this reason, they're not well visualized on standard T2-weighted imaging, but we can begin to see them relatively well with contrast-enhanced imaging, and in fact, the contrast-enhanced steady-state-free procession images, such as the cis imaging, is, uh, is quite useful in this regard. So here's a, an example of this. To orient you in, in the uh, left-hand side, we're looking at a sagittal view. Here again is the pons, here's the medulla, and uh, the inner part of the patient on the left-hand side of the screen, the back of the head on the right-hand side of the screen. And here, the black arrow is on the proximal cisternal segment of the abducens nerve, the sixth nerve, which innervates the lateral rectus muscle, uh, extending towards the dorsum of the clivus. And notice that you can't see the nerve past uh, that transition where it's no longer surrounded by cerebral spinal fluid. Here it is on the right-hand side with an axial reconstruction in the cisternal segment. But once we give contrast, at the bottom of the screen, you see a post-contrast cis image. You can now see the cisternal segment of the abducens nerve coming up. You can see where it pierces the dura and extends over the, the dorsal aspect of the clivus, and uh, in fact, into the cavernous sinus lateral to, here the asterisk is on the internal carotid artery, uh, and uh, into the superior orbital fissures. So we can often see the cranial nerves along a greater degree of their extent uh, once we apply the entirety of the protocol. Here's an example of post-contrast cis imaging of the cavernous sinus. 
And uh, here is the 3E segment, the oculomotor nerve on the right side. Here's the 4E segment, the, the intradural segment of the trochlear nerve, the uh, abducens nerve, the cranial nerve in the cavernous sinus, which is in the medial uh, compartment of the cavernous sinus, is seen here as that black dot. Here's the uh, ophthalmic division, the V1 uh, division of the trigeminal nerve, and, um, and here is the V2 uh, division, the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve. I like to write, by the way, V period 1, uh, period E, because I think that Roman numeral 6 looks quite similar to uh, the first um, trigeminal segment, and uh, I find that to be helpful for clarification. So this is cis imaging with contrast. Here's an example of how this is useful uh, for surgical planning. Here in the axial view, we have an axial view through the pons. On the right-hand side, this is the cisternal segment of the abducens nerve on the right side, and the asterisk is over a large mass. This patient was uh, neurologically intact at the time of presentation, and the question from the neurosurgeon is, of course, going to be, where is the abducens nerve on the left side? Well, we can't see it on this image, but once we give uh, so here again, the, the cisternal segment of the abducens nerve on the right side, where is it on the left side? Once we give contrast, however, we can see the, uh, the cranial nerve much better. We can see more detail. Notice that the arrowheads here, I've placed the arrowheads on the inner layer of dura, which we can see as a separate structure once we give contrast. The arrow, the white arrow, is pointing towards that black dot. That is the interdural segment, the E segment of the abducens nerve on the left side. And notice uh, how that is separated from this enhancing mass. Look at the change in intensity of that mass from the pre-contrast imaging. This is an enhancing meningioma. It's separated from that meningioma by about 1.5 millimeters. This patient was intact preoperatively, and in fact, postoperatively, they had no deficit. So that's the intradural uh, nerve, uh, the abducens nerve on the left side. And there can be asymmetry. And here, the, the abducens nerve had already exited the subarachnoid space on the left side. Uh, but was still within the subarachnoid space on the right side at the same level. Here's an example of uh, a patient with an abducens palsy where the typical imaging was normal, red is normal and is in retrospect. Here on the patient's left-hand side, you can see the interdural six nerve extending from the petroclival region into the cavernous sinus. And on the right side, however, uh, we don't see the abducens nerve. And why don't we see the abducens nerve? Well, here it is in sagittal section. The right-sided abducens nerve comes up, encounters the dura short, dural cave segment. The proximal interdural segment is well seen. The distal part, however, is pathologically enhancing, and that's why we don't see it on the right side. The cranial nerves, again, do not enhance, except for the ganglia normally. And uh, so this is an example of pathologic enhancement of the abducens nerve in the interdural segment in a region we wouldn't typically see on standard imaging all that well. Here's a patient, who, a VIP patient, who came to us from an outside institution after about a year and a half of imaging for, for right-sided facial pain, diagnosed with trigeminal neuralgia. They were coming to our institution for microvascular decompression. This was the outside film. We thought there might be a very subtle asymmetry. This was read as normal, I should say, outside. We thought there might be some subtle asymmetry in Meckel's cave, but it wasn't clear. They came for microvascular decompression. They had our high-resolution protocol in the morning of the planned surgery for microvascular decompression. And here in the coronal view, we can see the normal left V2E, the intradural uh, maxillary uh, division of the trigeminal nerve on the left side, and it's normal, it's, and it's also black. On the right-hand side, where is it? It's this structure here. It's not black any longer. It's pathologically enhancing and thickened. And this was not a patient with neurovascular compression. They didn't need neurovascular decompression. This was, in fact, perineural spread of adenoid cystic carcinoma, entirely changing the management of the patient. And so this is uh, obviously perineural spread of disease, takes advantage of the reduced barriers to entry into the intracranial compartment through the foramina. The foraminal segment is surrounded also by, to some extent by venous blood and bone. It's not well visualized on the standard T2-weighted imaging, uh, but we can use the contrast-enhanced state-free state procession imaging for that. And here's an example of the superior orbital fissure where you can see the, the third nerve on the, the um, left figure here uh, passing through the cisternal segment. Here's the intradural segment, and now into the superior orbital fissure. After contrast, we can see that well. Again, notice how well we can see, for instance, the inner layer of dura distinct from the intradural space. In the coronal view, this is the right side of the patient. Here's the interclinoid process, the optic strut, and here is the um, optic nerve and its uh, canal.
and the, the various other foraminal um, segments of the cranial nerves passing through the superior orbital fissure. <coughs> Here's an example of the, uh, the second division of the trigeminal nerve passing in through the foramen rotundum from the cavernous sinus into the pterygopalatine fossa. And we can see it here again normally in the coronal view, the cranial nerve should be dark and non-enhancing, as I said. This is a mass which we don't need uh, high resolution imaging to detect. This is uh, just to emphasize the fact that uh, this is a mass of the optic nerve. And a mass of the optic nerve uh, has to be, cannot be a schwannoma through the foraminal segment. This was an optic nerve glioma, again, part of the central nervous system and centrally myelinated, as you're aware. This is a patient who came to us from another well-known American academic institution uh, and uh, had a history of uh, diagnosed with optic neuritis on the right side and visual loss. They came to us for high resolution imaging. You can see enhancement here in the optic canal in the foraminal segment and the impression had been compatible with optic neuritis. We did high resolution imaging at our institution and uh, here on the left hand side, this is post contrast fat saturated T1 weighted imaging. You can see the enhancing uh, enhancement here, in fact, with a dural tail. And in the, the axial view, uh, post contrast on the cyst, similar to that case I showed you with the optic nerve before in the meningioma in the supracellar cistern. Here we see the optic nerve displaced by this mass. This is, in fact, uh, not optic neuritis. This was a meningioma uh, medial to the optic nerve in the optic canal. The patient was taken to surgery. Here are some interoperative views. This is the dura overlying the mass. The meningioma here is being removed. And uh, that's the optic nerve, the foraminal segment of the optic nerve. The patient uh, did quite well postoperatively, approached via an endoscopic um, surgical approach. The extra foraminal segment is surrounded variably by fat, muscle, and, and bone. Uh, here are some examples of the detail we can see on high resolution imaging. This one I actually acquired of one of my technologists uh, with a surface coil. Um, and. Uh, with a slightly higher spatial resolution, but many of these details are also seen on typical imaging. Here you can see through the orbit in the coronal view, this is the inferior extraforaminal division, the inferior branch of the extraforaminal division of the oculomotor nerve right below the optic nerve. See the optic nerve right above it. And in fact, you can see the uh, third uh, cranial nerve branching here the, into two fascicles to innervate the medial rectus muscle, which usually happens at the junction of the posterior one third and the anterior two thirds of the muscle. Here in the coronal view, uh, another uh, patient referred from another institution diagnosed with an optic nerve glioma, this time on the left side. Here's a coronal view through the right side. You can see the, the optic nerve here, and below it, the inferior branch of the extraframinal division of the third nerve. And here, on the left-hand side, the pathologic side, the asterisk is on the enhancing mass. It is, in fact, on uh, high-resolution imaging seen to be not arising from the optic nerve. Uh, this structure, which is indicated by the dotted arrow, but displacing the optic nerve. And this was not, therefore, not an optic nerve glioma, uh, but diagnosed as a schwannoma. Uh, just one or two uh, additional examples in my remaining um, one minute of time. In the sagittal view, with the anterior being to the left and the posterior being to the right, this is the stylomastoid foramen. Here's the 7G, the facial nerve, the extraframinal, a portion of the extraframinal facial nerve coming into the parotid gland. And notice it branching in the parotid gland in the sagittal view. In the axial view, we used to use the retromandibular vein here indicated by the arrowhead to demonstrate the level of the uh, facial nerve. But you can see now the facial nerve within the parotid gland relatively well on high resolution imaging. And here are some examples of how that might be useful for different differential diagnosis. Here's a mass coming out of the stylomastoid uh, foramen extending into the parotid gland. And notice the uh, facial nerve coming off the tail end of this mass. This is a schwannoma. The next case is a case where there's a mass, this mass, which is displacing the, the extraframinal facial nerve rather than arising from it. Uh, and um, this was, in fact, a pleomorphic adenoma uh, displacing the mass, so a mass arising from the parotid. The last case is a case where you can see the facial nerve coming from the stylomastoid foramen. And then, just like that case of the interdural abducens nerve, uh, the nerve itself is no longer well seen in its distal extraframinal segment, and that's because it's pathologically enhancing. This uh, pathologic enhancement of the nerve was caused again uh, by perineural spread of disease, in this case by basal cell carcinoma. So the key points, the summary points, we can divide the cranial nerves for imaging purposes into these segments. The uh, segments of the cranial nerves uh, 
uh, should uh, alter our imaging approach. If we take the, the um, approach that I've described for you with the protocol I've described, it, it allows for imaging of the uh, greatest extent, we think, of the cranial nerves in these cases. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues in neurosurgery and neuroradiology, biomedical engineering, uh, ENT, and uh, thank you to Dr. Belish and Dr. Eliyahu for the, the honor of uh, speaking uh, to you here today. Thank you.